Good afternoon or good morning to all of you and welcome to this webinar on FRAX and the future of fracture risk assessment. My name is Dominique Pierrot and I'm the science manager at IOF. Before introducing the speaker of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during this webinar by typing them into the question box of the control panel and I will voice them to the speaker towards the end of the webinar. I would like to thank Agnovos and Amgen for their support to this webinar. This being said, I'm very happy to welcome today Professor Nicholas Harvey from the UK, who is Deputy Director and Professor of Rheumatology and Clinical Epidemiology at the MRC Life Course Epidemiology Unit at the University of Southampton. Professor Harvey is also the Chair of the Committee of Scientific Advisors at the IOF. Professor Harvey, we are listening to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dominique, and it's a great pleasure to be here to um, share with you in this Bonecast webinar some thoughts on the future of, fra of fracture risk assessment, really focused around uh, developments with the FRAX fracture risk assessment tool. So what I thought I would do over the next 35, 40 minutes or so is just illustrate briefly the, uh, the, some of the, the evidence around the burden of disease and epidemiology from some of the recent work that we've undertaken through the IOF. Just to set the scene really to demonstrate the need for uh, more efforts in terms of primary prevention and look at some of those uh, care gaps and the way in which uh, FRAX is used to address those and then really the, the sort of meat of the presentation in terms of how FRAX uh, is potentially being developed to think about other uh, potential uh, input variables or other considerations in, in moderating uh, the fracture risk calculated. So it comes as no surprise to this audience that fragility fractures associated with osteoporosis are a major public health burden with a huge impact at the level of the individual, at the level of healthcare systems and society as a whole. And you see here from these data from our recent um, EU6 report uh, demonstrating that the years lived with disability consequent to fragility fractures in the population are really up there with those associated with chronic lung disease or lung cancer and even dementia, although of course lagging behind ischemic heart disease. So fractures have a huge impact uh, on health in terms of disability and indeed mortality. And one of the major problems is that populations are getting older. You can see here the age distributions from the UN World Population Prospects. Uh, and you can see this 80 plus band uh, over the next uh, 100 years or so, it's just getting bigger in every uh, setting across the world pretty much. And that means that even if age and sex specific rates of hip fracture and other fractures remain constant, we are going to see an increase in fractures. And this is certainly what we uh, predict based on the uh, research uh, undertaken for the IOF uh, scope report 2021 recently published. And here we see that we, we expect an increase in yearly uh, fractures over the next few decades across Europe. And when we look at uh, the number of people at high fracture risk here uh, in, in our study uh, from the FRAX group, we can see that uh, there's going to be you know, a pretty much a doubling of, uh, of the number of individuals at high fracture risk, and that's sort of predicated on the, the FRAX approach. Um, where somebody has a, a fracture probability equivalent to that conferred by a prior fracture. And this goes from something around 135 million to, uh, in 2010 to double that in 2040. And a lot of that burden, as you can see from these relative increases, is going to be in low middle income countries. So the pattern and the impact of osteoporosis may well shift over the next 100 years to be from the sort of classic high income countries to an increasing burden on low middle income countries. But there's a huge uh, problem here. Although we have uh, a, a way of um, defining osteoporosis in terms of densitometry, we have that you know that's become uh, a di the clinical diagnostic criterion. Although we have fantastic ways of assessing risk 
uh, and identifying those at risk, and we have excellent treatments, we're just not doing enough of it. And there is still a substantial care gap, and this is demonstrated here through the scope report in Europe, and we can see that overall around 70% of women at high fracture risk do not receive appropriate assessment and treatment. And that sort of pattern has been seen across the world and it certainly is at the heart of the, the US um, Secondary Fracture Prevention Task Force approach with SBMR and uh, is, is a clear priority and was one of the many gaps um, that we identified in the World Osteoporosis Day report from 2016 uh, as part of the IOF work and is really at the heart of our UK work um, in, in my role as the, the Vice Chair of the Royal Osteoporosis Society um, uh, Bone Research Academy. And these gaps are across not just the sort of clinical aspects uh, of case finding and management, but there are also major gaps in terms of public awareness. So a fracture may not be perceived as having the same uh, impact on health as a heart attack, for example. But also syst systemic level issues and <clears throat> health policy issues. And so at, at every level, from the patient through the healthcare systems, public awareness, we need to do better at raising awareness and sorting the system to ensure that everybody who's at high fracture risk is appropriately identified and treated. And of course, risk assessment tools such as FRACs are absolutely at the heart of that sort of process. So what are the approaches to closing the gap? Well, of course, you know, we have secondary prevention, so preventing a subsequent fracture after a first, and uh, the IOF Capture the Fracture Programme, of course, is the global uh, leader and sort of benchmark in that sphere. But we'll focus now on primary prevention, which is, of course, the really the setting for uh, most FRAX usage. So you can see here the distribution of bone mineral density in a population and going back to that original WHO uh, classification of osteoporosis designed originally for studies rather than clinical use with osteoporosis on densitometry with a t-score of minus 2.5 or below but you can see that actually at you know 0.6 percent of the population it's a very low uh, proportion of the population and that many, many, many more people have uh, low bone mass, uh, but low to normal bone mass. And that's an issue because although um, BM, low BMDT score marks you out as being individually at high risk of fracture, because the, those, uh, those people at high risk are not that frequent, there aren't many of them in the population compared to the vast number of people with low normal or normal BMD. When you look at the number of fractures, and that's these grey bars here, you can see that more fractures happen in the population with normal or low normal BMD than do in the population with a very high BMD, with a very, very low BMD, but a high risk of fracture individually. So that was really the sort of thinking that led to the inception of, of FRAX uh, in the first place. It was the question of how to better identify people who go on to fracture. And really the concept is not, not a sort of idea of, if you like, diagnosing a future fracture, but of identifying people who we judge are at high enough fracture risk to make it worthwhile treating them with anti-osteoporosis medications. And that's a very subtle distinction from other sorts of approaches where you might, you know, for example, uh, do a, a mammogram to detect early disease um, for uh, a, a future uh, breast cancer. This is about assessing risk, uh, which is high enough to uh, predicate treatment. And of course, FRAX was uh, developed, as, as most of you will know, on the basis of a large number of um, highly comprehensive and carefully worked out systematic reviews for the individual risk factors with some risk factors making the cut and some not. And the idea was to construct a calculator that would be based on a limited number of readily clinically available uh, input variables. And of course, you know, things like country, bone mineral density, age, uh, gender, clinical risk factors, as you can see here. Uh, which are readily available if they're not in the medical record already 
they can be obtained from the patient by, uh, by asking them pretty simply. And the thought was that risk factors, as well as being easily obtainable and usable in primary care uh, from questions, i.e. no measurements other than uh, bone mineral density, um, and, and that is of course optional, is that the these clinical risk factors would tell us about a risk which is at least partly independent of bone mineral density. So it tells us a bit about something a bit extra, but that it's uh, also intuitively linked to the outcome of fracture. And also that the risk associated with that risk factor is reversible. And that's, that's not to say that you can change the risk factor, of course you can't make somebody younger, but it's it's saying that if you identify people on the basis of those risk factors, then when you target them with anti-osteoporosis treatments, then they work. Uh, and that is, is uh, the case for, for uh, this setup. And across uh, 10 or so larger population cohorts, um, and then validated another 10 or 11 or so across many tens of thousands of person years of, of follow-up. Uh, the tool was developed and validated. And the output, of course, is a 10-year probability of fracture. That's either major osteoporotic fracture, so hip, clinical vertebral, proximal humerus or distal forearm, or hip fracture. And the unique point about the FRAX tool is that it combines the risk of fracture with the risk of death over that 10-year period to give you a probability of having a fracture. And of course, the higher your risk of death, the, the lower, the, the less sort of chance there is of you having a fracture because you have less time in which to fracture. And that's important, particularly at very uh, older ages, um, where the expected remaining lifetime may be less than 10 years. And in this setting, the metric gives you the effectively the remaining lifetime probability of fracture. So FRAX is well set up for the uh, the elderly population who might not survive 10 years. Uh, and I think the other point to make about this is that FRAX is calibrated to uh, the rates of fracture and death in individual countries where there's the country models. Um, so the the model itself uh, doesn't change, but it's calibrated to the epidemiology in individual countries. And you can see that's important here because when you look at background 10-year uh, probability, you can see it varies dramatically from being very high up in Denmark and Sweden, very low in China, for example. And you can see that there's a, if you predicated your um, your threshold for intervention at a particular level, it might be applicable to one country but not another. And what we found when we undertook a systematic review of uh, FRAX used in uh, various guidelines internationally was that it, it's caught about 120 guidelines or papers, um, but in 38 no thresholds were defined. And that's a problem because it's all very well knowing that somebody has a particular fracture risk, but you know, is that high, is that low? Do you want to compare it with the population's fracture risk? It's very helpful to have a threshold above which one can say that this patient should be treated. In 58 uh, guidelines, there was a fixed threshold, and indeed 39 used a 20% a major osteoporotic fracture threshold, in, in a large part because that's what's done in the US. And as you can see from this figure on the right here, um, actually that may be completely inappropriate. Uh, particularly for countries with very low background fracture rates. So in the UK, as, as uh, per the European model, we use an age-dependent threshold where the threshold is the probability of a fracture over the next 10 years equivalent to that conferred by a prior fracture with an average BMI uh, and no other risk factors considered. And, that, um, and there's pros and cons to uh, either approach fixed or age-dependent. Uh, and um, in some ways, threshold setting is as much a philosophy as a as science. But uh, when you do that approach with the age dependent, it allows you to sort of taper it more easily to the individual population, and to uh, sort of get a closer fit to the uh, to the uh, different ages. And so, at the moment, FRAX is um, used in 64 or so nations, 
um, in terms of models, 80% of the world population, 34 languages, and around 3 million visits a year, and, and really is the global standard. But of course, you know, no model is perfect, and so there are certainly things that can be done better. And for those of you in, in uh, who work with some of the uh, source cohorts, you'll be aware that uh, we're currently working on a, a revised model. And so the question is, are there other, I suppose, are there better ways of doing things with the um, existing risk factors? Are there new risk factors which should be considered as input variables? Or are there new risk factors which might be used to modify the FRAX output? And if you look very closely at your screens here, in the little grey box underneath the red box here, um, the, it says adjust with TBS. And so trabecular bone score is one example um, whereby the, the TBS measure is not included in the FRAX algorithm itself, but it's used through a, a major systematic review and meta-analysis uh, to build the model to uh, adjust the FRAX probability that comes out of FRAX uh, in what um, Eugene McCloskey terms as a post-translational modification. So let's just look at some of the things that, that we you know might be sensible to consider and some of the things that we've looked at that um, may not be leading anywhere. And so type 2 diabetes um, is clearly an increasingly um, important uh, factor associated with bone health. Type 1 diabetes is already considered in the FRAX model as part of the secondary causes. But there's increasing evidence that type 2 diabetes has an association with fracture risk, uh, and that's you know, partly independent of, of um, adiposity. And of course, there's various mechanisms which, which might uh, underlie that. But just as an example, evidence from Bill Leslie's group using the Manitoba database, we can see that compared with non-diabetics, diabetics were at greater risk of hip fracture, and that the fracture risk was greater than that expected from uh, fracture probability uh, from FRAX. So FRAX doesn't seem to capture all of the risk in diabetics, so that's certainly one possibility, and these data are consistent with, with several other studies out there. What about falls? It's certainly been one of the uh, criticisms of FRAX over the years that falls are not included. And in fact, what we find is that uh, FRAX probability actually predicts falls. So this is in the, the Mr. Ross Sweden cohort, uh, several thousand individuals. And if we look at uh, prior falls as a predictor of, of future falls, and then a high FRAX probability, and we used it here, a major osteoporotic fracture threshold of 15%, which gave us a similar sort of uh, yes-no distribution to the uh, prior falls yes-no. We can see that it predicts falls pretty consistently with time, whereas prior falls uh, has really quite a time-dependent waning in predictive value for future falls. So FRAX has some predictive capacity for falls, so it captures some of that falls risk, but really the issues around falls and inclusion of falls is to do with the quality of the data, the consistency between cohorts, does whatever the question is on falls mean the same thing in each cohort, can they be brought together in a way that will be meaningful uh, and consistent in the final calculator, and that was certainly the issue uh, the first time around. So it remains to be seen what the uh, what the cohorts um, bring uh, when we look again. And of course, the, the question of, of uh, is really not so much about falls and instant falls, but falls and instant fracture. And here in the, uh, in the combined Mr. Ross cohorts across uh, US, Sweden and Hong Kong, we found that the hazard ratio for fall, no fall in the past 12 months for any fracture or major osteoporotic fracture uh, was um, similar for, uh, for falls and fracks uh, as a sort of high fracture probability uh, measure and actually independent, so falls adjusted for fracks didn't attenuate and, and vice versa. So there's certainly um, an independent signal of falls on top of fracks even though there's some, uh, some collinearity between them uh, and that's certainly something that is worth uh, looking at. <clears throat> 
extending from um, extending from falls, what are other measures related to uh, mobility and muscle strength and so forth? And we've we've undertaken a series of studies in the Mr. Ross cohort, looking at physical performance, appendicular lean mass, and sarcopenia, um, and they're sort of summarised in our recent editorial. But what what we were really wanting to know is a does um, do these factors predict fracture and b do they do that independent of things that we can very easily measure you know for example there's not that much point from a, a fracture probability point of view doing a whole body dexa scan which takes 10 minutes potentially um, if you can do a 30 second uh, hip scan and then the femoral neck bmd gives you all the risk information and nothing is added from appendicular lean mass um, or likewise for a functional measure and what we find is that the greater the time it takes you to do five chair stands, uh, the greater your risk of fracture. Um, and that this was independent of prior falls, independent of fracture probability with or without BMD, and independent of femoral neck T-score. We found that grip strength uh, was protect higher grip strength was protective, largely independent of BMD and frax. Walking speed again, uh, gait speed uh, protective independent of BMD. But then, interestingly, appendicular lean mass, normalised for height squared in the way that it's normally used, but actually similar results for just straight ALM. Higher appendicular lean mass is um, protective for fracture, unadjusted except for age and follow-up time, independent of falls and fracts without BMD, attenuated a little bit with fracts with BMD. But then really that, that effect is completely removed by adjustment for femoral neck BMD T-score. So whatever uh, fracture risk signal we're getting from ALM, it's, um, it's not there once you adjust for femoral neck BMD. Now this was in, in older men, so we looked in the Women's Health Initiative um, and that in, in, again, many tens of thousands of individuals that uh, we found um, really a very similar uh, sort of findings. So again, in the base case, uh, higher appendicular lean mass uh, was protective for fracture, but then you can see this attenuation, um, and then particularly when you adjust for femoral neck T-score for both um, osteoporotic fracture and major osteoporotic fracture. And actually it looks almost like higher ALM becomes a risk factor for fracture uh, when you um, when you adjust for femoral neck BMD. And that's, you know, we've looked at why that might be, and there's certainly a, a correlation between ALM and femoral neck BMD. There's a sort of biological relationship, of course, with the mechanostat idea. There's a, a, there's a, a sort of measurement relationship because of the, uh, the way that DEXA solves the compartment um, between bone, fat, and lean. And so we've gone on to look at um, PQCT measures as a separate uh, measure. And there actually it's the, the muscle density that appears to retain a protective effect. A muscle cross-sectional area, again, is, is rather attenuated. So it seems that appendicular lean mass from DXA is not a particularly helpful measure for fracture risk prediction. So then we went on to look at sarcopenia and of course you'll be aware that there's around 11 or so uh, sarcopenia definitions out there um, and across them you know they, they would categorize in these cohorts somewhere between 0.5 and 30 percent of individuals as, as sarcopenic depending upon which definition you use. I've just summarized some of the findings of four of them so the international working group, um, the Asian working group, the European working group and the, the second version and the um, SDOC um, sarcopenia definitions and outcomes consortium and it's worthwhile noting that these first three um, include appendicular lean mass um, so this is the hazard ratio for major osteoporotic fracture sarcopenia yes no and we can see that they're predictive of fracture but attenuated after adjustment for BMD femoral neck t-score the SDOC definition which does not include appendicular lean mass remains pretty robust and is not changed by adjustment for femoral neck BMD. So I think this really, as I think pretty much that most of the people, most of the investigators working on sarcopenia would agree across the various definitions now that 
a particular lean mass from DXA is not a particularly useful um, uh, input variable, and that we there may be other measures, for example, PQCT or um, creatine dilution, for example, may uh, may provide more useful measures of, of appendicular lean mass. But I think coming back to the question in hand for today, having done all of this, um, it seems that um, appendicular lean mass itself is not going to be a useful input variable for FRAX. Um, it's unlikely that that there's there's not that many cohorts with uh, functional performance measures in a way that uh, we could derive measures and I think there's a real question about whether one wishes to include extra tests in something that is uh, predicated on being very easily usable um, and, and so I think the, the the information that we can get from uh, easily available clinical risk factors which you can just ask a question I think it should remain at the core of the of the modeling so what about um, very high fracture risk well clearly we want to be identifying people at very high fracture risk and uh, you may well ask well yes you may also well say well that that's that's obvious and, and what do you mean by very high fracture risk um, but this is a concept that is, is emerging from uh, a, a working group, IOF SKO uh, working group um, last year, which really set out to look at whether we should sort of take a fresh look at um, not just identifying people for treatment or not for treatment, but whether we should then, uh, for those at high risk or very high risk, uh, think about trying to stratify them further and then target our treatment um, appropriately. And the reason for that is that we now have several um, uh, anabolic agents, uh, not necessarily in, in every individual country, but globally. And there are head-to-head -head studies with anti-resorptive demonstrating superiority for the anabolics, both in terms of speed of action and magnitude of, of, um, of risk, uh, risk reduction. So it makes sense that in somebody who's got very high risk, you might want to um, look at, uh, for example, an anabolic first type of approach, or at least um, a parenteral therapy rather than oral bisphosphonate. And the idea was that using this sort of European model uh, where the, the intervention threshold, which is the probability equivalent to that conferred by prior fracture, um, is here in this dotted line. And that um, if you haven't had a BND test yet, uh, then you can either be uh, low risk in this amber zone, which suggests having a BND test. And then if you're in this red zone, it's highly unlikely that a BMD test will bring you down. So here we're saying you're definitely high risk and we'll call this very high risk. Um, and then uh, so you can end up in, in a number of places after your initial initial FRAX clinical risk factor based assessment. You can either be green, well that's good, um, you measure BMD for, uh, if you're in this amber zone, um, in that case you might end up being in the amber zone but above the threshold and that's historically high risk. You might be in the red zone initially and you stay in the red zone. Um, you might end up after measurement of BMD being in below the threshold in which case you go to low risk. And then we can think about stratifying treatment. And of course, in everyone, you want to optimize nutrition, lifestyle, um, you know, encourage people not to take up smoking and drinking to excess, um, to take appropriate exercise, falls prevention, so forth, optimize calcium vitamin D status. And in the low risk group, you might consider, uh, particularly in recently menopausal women with symptoms, um, interventions such as menopausal hormone therapy, or in older postmenopausal women, you might consider um, a, a, a serum, for example. For the high risk group, um, one would consider oral bisphosphonates, um, other inhibitor of bone resorption, perhaps uh, parental therapy. You might consider a local osteoenhancement procedure if, uh, if there's a specific concern around hip and femoral neck, BMD. Um, but for those at very high risk, w you might consider an anabolic agent followed by an inhibitor of bone resorption to actively build up bone mass and then uh, to uh, maintain it. And that, that sort of 
um, achieve remission and then maintain remission sort of approach is what, of course, historically has been used in, in cancer, but is now very much at the heart of inflammatory arthritis. Uh, uh, you know, so so it, it's it's what what my colleagues in, in the rheumatology department will be doing for, to manage rheumatoid arthritis, hit it hard early on, get control, and then maintain control. And of course, you know, this is very much an aspiration, and you know, to me, it makes complete uh, clinical sense. Whether you can actually enact it, of course, will depend upon the local uh, guidelines and, and what your regulators permit. But you know, I think it, it's it's beholden on, on us as the representatives of the field to try to drive forward the best care for our patients. And, and often in that sort of sequence of events, the, the regulators and the, the policymakers catch up. Um, so I think we should be going out there and, and uh, really um, putting forward uh, the, what we view as the best ways for uh, treating patients. And of course, you can look, and, and as we have done in a um, a simulated population from the UK for in this case um, at the proportion treated and of course you can vary the the cutoffs a little bit um, according to the what makes sense for local population and what makes health economic sense um, and that's indeed the approach we've taken for the UK national osteoporosis guideline group guidelines which we're revising but you can see that generally uh, you get a greater proportion of high risk um, stroke very high risk at older ages, as, as you'd expect. So how do you get to be very high risk? Well, that's, I mean, you might think that, well, that's obvious, you, you have a recent hip fracture or you've got a vertebral fracture or uh, you're on steroids, but actually when you do the calculations, you find that having a single risk factor is often not enough to put you into that very, into that top level. Um, top level um, stratum and that it's usually a combination of risk factors uh, which which push you there and of course one very powerful risk factor is recent fracture and many of you will be familiar with this concept of um, imminent risk which um, has rather different meanings to different people and what I view the word imminent to mean is is a sort of time dependent uh, risk so what we found through many cohorts now is that um, the, if you have a fracture, your risk of uh, future fracture is uh, transiently very much increased uh, and that wanes over the next two years or so, but doesn't, doesn't go back to baseline, it still stays high compared with uh, how it was pre-baseline and then of course it increases with age. Um, and of course for for the vast majority of, of risk factors, um, and really I suppose being on a course of steroids would be the only exception, if a risk factor is giving you a high risk in the next two, five years or so, it will be giving you an even higher risk in the next 10 years. You know, there's no way that you can have a lower risk over 10 years than you would over two years. So what, what, we're, what we often find is that imminent risk is really talking about risk of fracture over the next two years, um, but really as a sort of representation of, of high fracture risk in general and giving that, that context that you're at really high risk, we need to get on and sort you out and treat you. But if we look a bit more about the effect of a prior fracture, here in the Reykjavik cohort in, in the, uh, an early part of a series of studies that we undertook through the FRAX group, we find that the incidence of a second major osteoporotic fracture immediately after or uh, after first is very high um, and then wanes over two years, stays above the baseline and then uh, rises with age as you'd expect um, relative to the risk of first MRF in the population. You can see it, it's almost three times at year one uh, but only 1.4 times at, at year 10 but always higher than the risk of first fracture in the population of the same age. And what we find is that the effect of a prior fracture, uh, a recent prior fracture, and also dependent on site, is so marked that actually it affects your tenure probability. Now, of course, the prior fracture has, um, has relevance not just for subsequent fracture risk, but also has relevance for subsequent death risk. And of course, if you have a hip fracture 
then you're at much higher risk of dying in the next 10 years than you would have been otherwise. And that, of course, has a competing effect on your risk of fracture. But what we've been able to do is work out multipliers to take into account um, both site of prior fracture and recency of prior fracture. So that if you calculate a fracture probability on the basis of the prior fracture box ticked, then you can take that FRAX probability and then adjust it using these multipliers um, to um, modify the probability to take into account recency. And you can see that here, and you can see that uh, because of a combination of the, the decreasing effect of mortality at younger ages and because at younger ages people are just, if they've got a risk factor, are more and more unusual compared to their peers, uh, the quantum of the, the multiplier goes up. But of course, that's a relative effect and their absolute fracture probability that they start off with will still be much lower at younger ages than it will be at higher ages. This, you may feel, looks rather cumbersome. And in fact, what we're working on now is a, a site that will enable one to uh, obtain the fracture probability and then uh, just via the website, modify it for uh, the additional effect of a prior of the recency and site of a prior fracture which will make life uh, much simpler uh, men and women age uh, and time and site and of course the there are several approaches now to looking at high fracture risk or very high fracture risk imminent risk whatever you want to call it and um, other approaches tend to be focused on calculating risk over two years. Actually, when you do the sort of comparison, they reassuringly, the quantum effect seems pretty similar. So there, there are clearly other ways of assessing risk over two years. But I think the issue is how one operationalizes that in the clinic. If one has a sort of AI approach based on big data, that may not be immediately implementable, implementable uh, in the GP practice. Um, and the other point is about plugging it into national guidance and if you've got national guidance which is predicated on a 10-year time span you've got uh, thresholds based on that then it's likely to be easier to use the maintain consistency and use the 10-year uh, time span to um, address that so just in the last um, five minutes or so i'll just share some thoughts about how this sort of approach, so it's not, not the high risk uh, fracture approach, but the, the age dependent, frax, the FRAX based approach um, has worked and has been tested um, in the field, as it were. So the SCOOP uh, randomized controlled trial across uh, seven UK centres, around 11,000 women aged 70 to 85 years, recruited in primary care and randomized to either screening or to usual care. And the screening um, arm were assessed for FRAX probability at the hip, a note at the hip uh, on questionnaires. And then for those at intermediate or high risk, then further refined using BMD. And those at high risk um, were informed by the GP and direct the patient that treatment was warranted. And over five years, this approach that was based on hip fracture probability reduced hip fractures by 28%. There was no effect on the on osteoporotic fractures or major osteoporotic fractures, uh, but hip fractures really quite a marked uh, reduction in fracture risk. And what we found also was that um, the intervention group, shown here in some of our subsequent work in Southampton, uh, had a, a much higher rate of um, treatment in the high risk group, as you'd expect. And, and what we found from uh, analysis led by Eugene McCluskey is that uh, it was really in these intervention group people at high fracture risk that uh, that the intervention had that uh, had a positive effect on fracture risk, and, and of course that's that's what you would expect because those are the individuals who get treatment, and it argues very strongly that the benefit is via treatment. And what we fi find is that actually adherence to treatment is much better in the high risk intervention group than in the usual care group as well for those that receive treatment. Although, as you can see, at only just under 40%, it's still not great. Um, and no effect on falls. So I think we're, we're seeing a sort of concentration of treatment in the high risk uh, having the effect. And what we find is that there's a high probability of cost effectiveness at the, the nice sort of threshold of around £20,000 uh, per quality. 
And in fact, uh, on subsequent analyses, it's cost saving £286 per patient and actually quality gaining per patient. So both in terms of cost effectiveness and in terms of um, in terms of clinical effectiveness, this approach seems to be beneficial. And that really has been backed up by a meta-analysis with two other studies, uh, one from Denmark, one from um, uh, from the Netherlands, which has shown a similar sort of pattern, although somewhat different in terms of their design, but overall um, showing a similar effect and, and when brought together, uh, a positive effect for screening. And so that sort of approach of using FRACs in this context of, um, you might call it screening, you might call it um, a systematic approach to uh, identification of those at high risk, is core to work that we're undertaking through the um, IRF Committee of Scientific Advisors and, and in the UK, um, a sort of automation approach uh, through the um, Royal Osteoporosis Society Research Academy. And it's really hoped with this sort of work, we can achieve a step change uh, in identification of individuals at high risk. And of course, FRAX and its developments are very much at the heart of that thinking. So to summarise, um, it's no, no big news to you that osteoporosis related fractures are common, huge impact on morbidity, morbidity mortality and economics and really have to be addressed at all levels uh, from patient to healthcare, healthcare systems to uh, policy, uh, individual countries and globally. FRAX is absolutely central to fracture risk assessment globally and as we look at um, the as the revision of the FRAX model, we can look at potential ways of refining the existing uh, models, potential ways of adding in new risk factors to the model itself, or to incorporate in, in this post-translational modification way. And so um, all ongoing, and um, obviously we look forward to um, a new model in due course. And I hope that sort of whetted your appetite for the future. So I'll just finish by thanking very much um, the IOF for this opportunity to, to share with you these thoughts as CSA chair and as a member of the FRAX group and um, as, as deputy director of the MRC Life Course Epidemiology Centre in Southampton. Uh, a thank you to my colleagues um, in Southampton internationally and, and the FRAX team uh, and to our funders for the uh, session today. So with that I will uh, finish and hand back to uh, Dominique to uh, chair the question and answers. Um, and I think I'm just going to move my camera across so I can look at Dominique without uh, you getting the side of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Harvey, for this brilliant and very comprehensive uh, presentation and, and for covering uh, a topic that stimulates uh, many, many discussion, many questions. Uh, I'm sure your talk was greatly appreciated by our audience. And now may I would like to move on to question. So maybe the first one um, by uh, Dr. Lekambassam um, is asking whether there is an added adjustment to be done for the dose of glucocorticoid prescribed. Yes, so that there is um, that has been looked at, and um, so there's we'd work that out in a more automated um, way for the UK model, um, and I can't quite remember what the the um, the, ad, the the numerical adjustment is, but it's uh, there is an adjustment, and, and basically it's around whether you're um, at sort of 7.5 milligrams or above. Um, and in in the UK model, linked to the NOG website, you actually get a, a sort of two crosses in that, and that's a post-translational modification in in the way that um, is, has been done for TBS as well, um, and I think sets a good sort of precedent for the, for that approach. But yes, there is a there is an adjustment that's possible. Uh, thank you. Now maybe I will just link to question one uh, asked by uh, Dr. Peggy Hill, and um, she's asking uh, if you agree that uh, anabolic medication as the first line of treatment for high risk of osteoporosis, but on the other hand. Uh, anabolic is not is not the first approach mentioned in the national guideline in some countries. So how do you see uh, the very high risk strategy working in this setting? Yeah, oh, I agree, and and I, that, that's what I was really alluding to in in my comments around the limitations of national guidelines. You know, in, in the UK we're the same. 
you know, nice guidance um, would not allow us to use um, so, well, Romosozumab is, is being looked at at the moment, but teriparatide is nice approved. We would not be allowed to use teriparatide in the anabolic first setting. So I think, you know, I, I think you can take two approaches in that setting. You can either say, oh, well, the national guidelines don't allow it, I'll forget about it. Or you can say, actually, I believe this is the best approach for my patients. And then it's about the national societies advocating for the approach. Um, it's about the experts coming together. It's about um, you know, the, the, the clinicians pushing for it. And it's about working together as an international community to try to change the policy. And I think, you know, interestingly, the approach that uh, in UK, I think, gives us quite a nice example of that. So the initial nice guidance around the use of anti-resorptives uh, was quite complicated to use in primary care when it came out. Um, I suppose 15 years ago or so now, um, and that, and the the UK National Osteoporosis Guideline Group came into being really as a way of simplifying the approach, and that brought in that age-dependent threshold rather than a series of rather complicated um, criteria based on age and prior fracture and and BND, which took you from alendronate to resendronate to strontium or whatever in, in the NICE guidance. And what we found is that actually now, after five, ten years, uh, it's the, the NOG guidance to which the NICE clinical care pathway refers and which the standards of care refer. And so we've gone from um, something being brought in by necessity of the limitations of the national guidelines to becoming endorsed and the sort of destination of the national guidelines. So I think don't give up hope. If, if we believe this is the right way to go, we should be working for it. And you know that, that is the aspiration. And clearly, we can't do everything at once and there will be limitations in the short term. But that's what we were, we're working towards. Thank you. And there's a question from uh, Dr. Mikhail. Um, are there any frax percentage of probability or moth or hip fracture that can, that can present a very raised higher risk of fracture? Yes, I mean, I think that was my point about the, the threshold setting. So you can take two approaches to this. One is either to just have a completely flat cutoff um, and, and say, well, I just think it's 20%, for example, is the US in osteopenia type cutoff. Um, or you can take an age dependent cutoff. And of course, if you take a, a flat cutoff, you'll treat um, fewer people at younger ages and perhaps more people at higher ages and, and the converse for an age dependent threshold. And I think it, it's important to recognise that fracture risk increases with age and also that, for example, the uh, what BMD tells you in terms of risk also varies with age. And so you know, if you've got a BMD of minus 2.5 at the age of 90, you may find that um, actually that's um, protective for fracture relative to a lower BMD or relative to the general population uh, for, because of the effects of age and the other factors associated with that BMD and that the average BMD in the population is below minus 2.5. So it's a really complex sort of setup which is why we go for that sort of absolute fracture risk approach. I wouldn't want to say any individual uh, fracture probability that confers high risk because it, you know, it, it depends upon age, uh, and I wouldn't want to do the sort of age-dependent approach a disservice. Uh, but I think you know, that there are, uh, there will be different approaches in different countries, and I suppose the you know, the good thing about the age-dependent approach is that it can be translated into the epidemiology of an individual country. Um, and, and it's you know it's perfectly possible at a particular age and in a particular country setting to make a judgment about what might be a high fracture risk. Um, you know, and certainly in the UK population at older ages, you know, somewhere around 30% would certainly be viewed as, as high fracture risk. Uh, but of course, you know, there's various considerations around that, and it won't be the same at all ages, and it won't be the same at all populations. Thank you. Uh, and there's a question from Dr. Lam. Um, uh, yeah, she's asking uh, how good is FRAX if you want to use it as a pre-screening tool in a community without BMD data? So FRAX uh, predicts future fracture as well as does BMD. 
the two together are a bit better than than either alone. Uh, but it's you know it's perfectly usable without BMD, and and the whole point really was to provide a tool which was usable in the absence of BMD, uh, and in a sort of perfect um, a sort of perfect sample of of the at the national level, uh, if your if your population is perfectly calibrated to the national model, then um, that you'll get the sort of distribution of risk to be the same with clinical risk factors or BMD included. So yes, it's perfectly usable if you've got BMD added in. If you don't, then use it without. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lesniak from Russia is asking if you can comment on the treatment threshold for men. Why is it similar to that in women? Because she's mentioning that, for example, in Russia, um, when 30 31 women are eligible for treatment, but only for percent of the men population. Yes, yeah, so, so it, it's really saying that at a particular probability threshold, you know, men and women at that probability threshold are both high enough to be treated. Um, and, and that's because the you know, health economically, it works um, to treat at the same threshold. And, you know, I think there's no particular reason to say you know, when you're looking at risk of a fracture, you know, we're not looking at BMD, we're not looking at risk factors, we're looking at risk of a fracture. There's no particular reason to say that, well, at 20% or 30% risk of fracture, men should not be treated. The, the problem, is, you know, the issue is not a problem because men generally have lower fracture risk than women at any particular age. And that's why a lower percentage of men will get over that threshold than will women. But it's saying at, at any particular threshold, you know, both men and women will be treated. Okay. Uh, another question from Dux, Dr. Cox. Um, how do you see uh, repeated falls on the frax of a patient? And on top of that, if the patient is poorly, uh, as a poor daily intake, can that also negatively influence the FRAX results? Okay. And so, did um, Dr. Cox specify intake of what? Uh, uh, intake, food, food intake. Oh, food, okay. Food, right. So, so food, if they're general. starving and fading away, yes. No, no, okay. In general. Yeah, so really, we're talking about sort of frailty, malnourishment. Yes, I, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and absolutely. So, so I think taking the, the falls issue, um, it's it's very difficult. I, I suspect it's going to be very difficult to sort out recurrent falls and injurious falls because the data are captured in so many different ways in the various cohorts. There's certainly evidence uh, from studies thus far that you know, if you're if you have injurious falls, you're at high risk of fracture, um, and some, you know, in the greater number of falls, that the, the greater risk of fracture. I think it's going to be difficult to get that level of granularity. And if, if falls are included, you know, it's likely to be falls, yes, no. Um, I think that the data are just not there in the same way that they are for, for prior fracture. Um, but um, in terms of sight or recency. Um, so, and then in frailty, again, I think it, frailty is a, a sort of difficult concept and it is in this sort of context uh, because you obviously have to find a way of defining it. And you know, diet, of course, weight and BMI is included anyway, so that'll capture some of the signal. Prior falls might capture some of it. We, we were keen, I think, generally to avoid uh, physical performance measures that might be part of the frailty phenotype and to make sure that it doesn't overburden the the risk assessment with with those sorts of of extra things that, that also might be difficult for the patient. So I think you know, that, that there will be signals associated with frailty in terms of falls, BMD, uh, BMI and so forth. Um, and of course, you know, FRAX is part of clinical judgment. It doesn't replace clinical judgment. It's a tool to be used by physicians, taking into account the whole patient and, and all the other things that go with it. So, you know, I think it, it, it's absolutely vital to remain the physician and, and retain that clinical judgment as well. Okay. Uh, another question from uh, Dr. Grigorie is asking you if you think that after adjusting for fracture recency, uh, don't you think that all other adjustments will be negligible, uh, will have a negligible impact on the fracture probability? 
Well, I think it depends what you mean. I think if, if the, because of course that's post all of the other existing risk factors contributing to, mo to the model. And it's clear that in, in the context of the model as it stands, recency and site information has quite a marked effect on the fracture probability. Whether it might um, have a, a, an independent effect over and above uh, other factors that might be added in as a post-translational modification, I think remains to be seen. And of course, not everybody will have information on, on everything. And, and, and that's the complexity in the modeling. Um, in that you know, we need to be thinking about these interactions that might be there. So, so I think it's absolutely a really good question and one that will emerge from the, the modelling as we go forward. Um, thank you. Now one question uh, from Latin America from uh, Dr. Roras. She is asking uh, uh, whether uh, Bolivia can use the FRAX model used in Argentina or Mexico. Um, or do they need to make adjustment to the to the Bolivian population? Yes, I think that that's the sort of thing probably to take offline uh, yes. with the FRAX group um, separately, because I, I just off the top of my head, I'm not familiar enough with the individual populations to to know that. But but in 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 general, um, if there's a if there's not a country specific model for a particular country, uh, sometimes you know there is a precedent for using. Um, a surrogate model from a neighbouring country or a similar population. Of course, that comes with caveats, and you know it's not always as similar uh, as we think. And and there's also you know it's not just the frax, it's not just the fracture risk, it's the death risk as well. Um, and of course, then there may be complications from from different um, ethnic groups and populations within an individual country uh, who may have different fracture risks. Um, so it's complex, and and I'm happy to take that offline. Um, if uh, if you wish. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, from pro, uh, from Dr. Adar, uh, can we expect uh, to have TBS included in the FRAX algorithm itself in the near future? No, I, I think the, there's a distinction here mm -hmm. between variables, input variables that that we have in a consistent enough way across all of the source cohorts to include in the model itself compared with other variables where we might have you know just in a selection of the cohorts um, where we feel that the you know it, it's a it's a robust enough finding that it can be used to modify frax probability but it's not been derived um, in we, we're not able to derive it with quite such comprehensive rigor as we across all the cohorts as we would with, with you know, things like age and sex and BMI and so forth. So I think it's unlikely that TBS will become part of the uh, FRAX algorithm itself, and you know it works perfectly fine as the uh, as the modifier as it is. Um, and of course, the same sorts of considerations apply to other potential uh, effect modifiers as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. I have another question uh, from Dr. Capozzi related on uh, uh, TBS. Uh, she's also asking whether uh, TBS could really increase the value of PRAX uh, in both young and old patients. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, TBS is a, is a certainly useful adjunct, um, particularly for those, um, you know, it, it's helpful in in adding clinical information, particularly for those around the, the thresholds. Um, and I think many people find it really useful in just making that, that clinical judgment about whether to treat or not. I mean, obviously, if, if you're well up into the red zone, it may not add that much information, but in, in that sort of intermediate group, it, it, it can be hugely useful. Um, and I think that's both in, in the young and the old. Okay, and maybe the, the last question uh, for today, uh, because we are close to Gosh, the yes. hour, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, another question from uh, Dr. Lam. Uh, she's asking, uh, what is your opinion on using FRAX and asking uh, for sarcopenia situation by using the SARC questionnaire, for example? Will that be helpful to predict the risk of a hip fracture? I think one just needs to view them as, as separate ways of, of doing it. I mean, you can't synthesize them together. I, I'd say you know, it's it's good to look comprehensively at the clinical situation 
and if somebody's at risk of sarcopenia, build that in. Um, certainly, a more formal way of considering sarcopenia in, in fracture risk assessment, uh, not not in fracture itself, but um, as a, a, a sort of a different way of looking at things is certainly something we're we're interested in in Southampton, um, and in, in in collaboration with the Frax group. So I think it's certainly something that that is being worked on. But I think you know for the moment it, it's really about gathering relevant clinical information and making an informed clinical judgment about. Um, about the best way to approach the patient. Okay, thank you. So now I think it's time to conclude. I'm sorry we don't have time to answer all the questions, but um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, Q&A session. I would like to thank you all for your participation in this webinar, and we hope that you enjoyed this session. Uh, we will post the recording of the webinar on the IOF website, and you will receive also the link by email tomorrow. Uh, you will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar, and we would appreciate your input and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. I would like to thank uh, Amgen and Agnovos for the support. Um, and uh, last but not the least, if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send them over to webinar at osteoporosis.international. Uh, uh, and thanks again, Professor Harvey, for your great talk. Uh, can you just maybe move to the next slide? Can I Indeed. just Oh, yes, you? I'll do that. There we go. Yes, to thank everybody and to thank again our uh, sponsor for this webinar and to thank you, uh, Professor Harvey, for this great talk. And um, goodbye to every to everyone, and uh, I wish you a nice day or a nice evening. Yes, thank you very much, and best wishes to all. Best wishes. Bye bye.